So shalom everyone again and uh, I would love to share with you the teaching that I prepared just about a few days ago. I never imagined that I will share it uh, not from a church pulpit but actually from a resort town called Eilat by the Red Sea but actually it makes sense to do it right by the Red Sea because uh, <laughs> definitely God was with the people of Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. So there is nothing but an amazing symbolism to share this message right here. Let's go back to the uh, words of Jesus from Luke chapter 24 in verse 44. Jesus said to the disciples prior to his departure, he said, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Jesus said all things that concerning him that were written not in the New Testament. He actually didn't have the New Testament. He said in the Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms and Moses concerning him, all of them must be fulfilled. Not some of them could be, all of them must be. And I think it's amazing because in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the prophet Isaiah was given an amazing sign, an amazing, an, an amazing symbol, as an amazing um, revelation of something that is about to happen. And he says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Immanuel. Isn't that interesting that the Bible is telling us in the prophet, in the book of the prophet Isaiah, that there will be a virgin. It's a woman that has never ever been, uh, she never slept with anyone. Nobody knew her in the biblical language. She was a virgin, yet she conceived while being a virgin, still being a virgin, and she will bear a son. By the way, the gender is very clear here. <laughs> and then, not only that we know that he is going to be a son, but he shall call his name Emmanuel. In other words, that son will have a name, a name that will basically describe him, Emmanuel. Now, in the Hebrew language, it's, it's very clear. Imanu, with us. El is God. God is with us. In other words, the virgin has nothing to do with God. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son who is God with us. Emmanuel. You have to understand, it's not a representative of God, but it is God with us. Emmanuel. It's not like God, it is God. And pay attention, folks, because the virgin here is not God, therefore is not to be worshipped or prayed to, but will give birth to God in the flesh. Which means, the emphasis, the one we need to worship, the one we need to pray to, it is the one she is going to give birth to. That's it. And it's very interesting because... This is one of the most amazing ways today to test any religion or cult if they are um, really in line with the Word of God or not uh, when it comes to Jesus. And I must tell you something, it, the number is mind-boggling. 95% of the world population, maybe even more, but 95% is, 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 is it. I would say a conservative number is actually, ladies and gentlemen, not in the mindset that Jesus is God. Now, I know that some of you are raising an eyebrow and saying, what do you mean 95%? Well, Orthodox Judaism, of course, does not believe that. 
And that is exactly why they blame Jesus for blasphemy, for equating himself to God. They don't believe Messiah is God. Therefore, if Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, he could have not been God. And if he claimed to be God, then no, and, and no one can be God but God, then obviously it's blasphemy. So Orthodox Judaism is definitely a religion that does not believe in the deity of Jesus. Muslims believe that Jesus is, of course, just a prophet. They don't believe he was God. Although the name of Jesus appears more often in the Quran than Muhammad, yet still he is not. The Mormons, of course, believe that Jesus and Lucifer and Satan are actually brothers. Um, he's not God. Jehovah's Witnesses believe he's an archangel. Hindus and Buddhists believe that he's a nice man. Catholics, ladies and gentlemen, when they pray to Mary and worship Mary, then Mary and Jesus are worshipped that actually says that they don't believe that Jesus is God the Father. Is God, excuse me, that Jesus is God, part of the Godhead that only has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means that their understanding of the deity of Jesus is less if Mary can be worshipped and prayed to at the same time. If that's not enough, there's all the New Age adherents that actually believe that we are gods. So, if we are gods, or Jesus is not super all the way, but he's God just like Mary, or if he's just a good man with good teachings, or if he's just an archangel, or if he's just the brother of Satan, or if he's just a, um, or a prophet, or if he's just a good man that took the wrong way, all of that, they do not believe in the deity of Jesus and the fact that Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one. It's very interesting, you know, the Jewish people pray, Shema Israel, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word one, Echad, is a complex unity. The word Yahid is single. So when God says, this is my only begotten son, the word in the Hebrew is Yahid. But when hero Israel, listen Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one, then that means, ladies and gentlemen, that means that God is a complex unity. It's very interesting. I'd like to touch two Emmanuel moments that I always share for many years with anyone that comes to Israel with me so you understand how much people realized when they came in those encounters with Jesus that there is no doubt God is there. First of all, in Mark chapter 4 verses 35 to 41, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us cross over to the other side. And now when they had left the multitudes, they took him along in the boat as he was. And another little boat were also with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep in a pillow. On a pillow and they awoke him and they said to him teacher bear in mind they only think he's a teacher do you not care that we per we're perishing they see someone sleeping sound asleep on a pillow not even afraid of anything yet they fret and they think they're about to perish and they cannot understand how come they don't have that same peace that he has. It's very interesting what came right after. The Bible said that he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. 
By the way, just so you know, the Sea of Galilee sometimes has clashes of winds from the Syrian African Rift Valley. So winds coming from the north or from the south, from the breeze of the Mediterranean coming from the west, and the desert eastern winds coming from the east. So we're talking about clash of so many winds that so many times causes waves up to almost 8 to 10 foot high. I, I remember days when the sea was so stormy we couldn't take off and I know that up until today some of us are still looking for fishermen that were lost in, in some of the, in some of the uh, uh, storms there. And Jesus said, peace be still. And isn't that interesting? The Bible says in verse 40, But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, faith, you don't, you, you don't have faith in a boat. Faith is in something much greater. And then they feared exceedingly. You know, they were afraid when the storm started. But the Bible says that after he calmed the storm, they feared exceedingly. And I want to take you back. You know, in, in those days, nobody owned a Bible. In those days, the Bible was not a book. It was a collection of scrolls of different, uh, you know, writers. Um, of course, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. But, but it wasn't in a shape of a printed book. Nobody could. Even the richest men in those days did not own a Bible. It was a, something that w would, would only be in a, in a temple in Jerusalem or in a synagogue, but not a private thing. And so you understand that people would go to the synagogue and they would not read. They would read only if they were the person who reads to everyone. But it's not like they showed up to the synagogue with their own Bible. And that's why the Bible says faith comes by hearing, not by reading, because they, they would come and they would hear. And they would believe if they only listened and took heed of those words. And the Bible says that um, they, that was their custom in those days, to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, just when, as Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth. And, and isn't that interesting that they did not have a Bible, yet how do you... How do you meditate on the Word of God day and night if you don't have it? You memorize it. And what is the easiest book to memorize, of course? The easiest book to memorize is, of course, the book of Psalm. More songs were from Psalm than probably any other book in the Bible. And uh, you can sing the book of Psalm. Up until today, most of the Messianic songs in Hebrew are from the book of Psalm. So, there is, if there is one book most of the Jews in those days could memorize and did memorize is the book of Psalms. And it's very interesting because when you read Psalm 89 verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, Lord God of hosts, Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. And when it waves rise, you still them. Every Jew in those days knew one thing. The only person who could ever calm the raging of the sea and the waves and can still them is Lord God of hosts. So when they saw Jesus doing that, they actually asked themselves, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? And that may explain to you why they feared exceedingly. They may have started realizing it may have been an Emmanuel moment that it is not just a teacher. It is God with them. Emmanuel. Very interesting because the Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 8, So it was as the multitudes pressed about him to hear the word of God. Isn't that interesting? Jesus never walked with the Bible. As I said, nobody walked with the Bible. And they see that it was that the multitudes pressed upon him to hear the word of God. This, whoever he is, he is the Word of God, or He gives the Word of God, but they want to hear the Word of God from Him. 
They don't want to hear the words of the rabbis. They don't want to hear the word of a teacher. They don't want to hear a commentary. They don't want to hear some explanation. The Bible says they pressed about him to hear the word of God. They knew from him we will hear the word of God. Why? Because he is the word of God. And the, it, the Bible says that he stood by the lake at Nazareth and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and they were washing their nets. And if you ever come to Israel with me, I'll show you exactly where it happened. We found that place. And then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down, and every time Jesus sits down, he's about to teach. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, it's very interesting because the Bible doesn't tell us that they listened very carefully, that they were amazed at every word that, that came to the, out of his mouth. Maybe they were actually waiting for some miracles because Jesus rebuked them for so many times that they're only looking for miracles. It's, a, it's an adulterous generation that is looking always for signs and wonders and miracles. So the Bible says that he had stopped speaking and he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. It's very interesting because Simon at that time is not yet fully uh, uh, in, engaged in Jesus' mindset and, 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 and ministry. He respected him as a teacher. He respected him as maybe a rabbi. But Simon was afraid that Jesus is now going to embarrass himself. So he actually said this, Master, we are the fishermen. <laughs> We've toiled here all night and caught nothing. But then comes this Jewish accent, Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Isn't that interesting that he kind of, listen, there is nothing here, but if you say, I'm going to do it. It's very interesting because they had done this, the Bible says, they caught a great number of fish and they, their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Now, those boats don't sink easily unless it's a huge weight. Listen, these fishermen never ever in their life had fished that many fish in such a short time in one specific place. It was no doubt an act of God. And the Bible says, when Simon Peter saw it, look at what happened. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man alone. You know, when you come in the presence of God, Two things happen. First, you understand how sinful you are. And then, you cannot withstand the holiness of the Lord. Depart from me. Now, it's, it's amazing because if you really think about it, Isaiah the prophet in chapter 6, verse 1 to 5, had almost the same experience when he was brought before the presence of the Lord. In the year of King Uzziah, died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two covered his face, and two covered his feet, and two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. There's no doubt Isaiah came to the presence of, of God and the post of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, you know that Jesus is the only one people can see, but no one could see the Father and live. We know that because the God the Father said that to Moses. And here it says, For my eye have seen the King. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So it's it's beautiful that in the presence of, of the Lord, 
you can see that Isaiah had almost the same reaction as Peter had. Whoa! I'm too sinful. I cannot withstand. Woe to me. I am an unclean man, unclean lips. It's amazing. It's amazing how you see that. And it's, you know, in Exodus 33, and I said that before, in Exodus 33, verses 9 to 11, it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses, and all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man at his tent door. So the Lord, watch this, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Isn't that interesting? The Lord spoke to him face to face. You know, in Luke chapter 2, when Simeon, the old man in Jerusalem, had that amazing encounter. The Bible says, after three days they found in verses uh, 45 to 50, later on they found Jesus in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening them, to them and asking them questions. And of course, all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? And look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And then he said to them, Look, it's his parents in this world. But he said to them, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, she just said, Look, your father and I. But Jesus is not talking to them about them. I've, I'm the son. My father it is in heaven. And I'm about my father's business. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. They didn't understand. It's very interesting. The Bible says that when Moses, in chapter 33 of Exodus, in verse 18, Moses says, please show me your glory. And then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. So obviously, if you see the Lord, if you see the Lord and live, that's not the Father. It is, of course, Jesus. And Jesus said, you see me, you see the Father, of course. And the Lord said, here's a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock, so it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by, and then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Amazing. Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Is that interesting? The man worships God. The Holy Spirit tells him that he is going to see the Messiah, who is the Son. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. So watch this. It's, it's how the, it's the whole trinity is in this picture. The Holy Spirit is telling him that. He is blessing God and he's saying, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Isn't that interesting? He could see Jesus. He could see God. He could see our salvation, Yeshua. And he prays to the Father. The Holy Spirit told him that he's going to hold the Son. And that's how you can see God. 
It's amazing. Now, what does the Bible say, of course, about the deity? In John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Jesus is making it very, very clear. It's not two, we're one. I and my Father are one. It's very simple. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, because He is equal with God. It's very simple. John 17, 21. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. We are one. John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bos bos bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Isn't that amazing? It cannot be more clear than this. If that's not enough, Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. For in Him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. Wow! Now, Jesus Himself claimed to be God. It's not like He wanted people to guess. It's not like He left. If a John 10, 33 says, The Jews answered Him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. You say you're God. That's why we are going to stone you. John 5, 18. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill Him, because He not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was His Father, making Himself equal with God. Isn't that amazing? The Word, the Bible says, He's the Word. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on, we know in John 4, in the same chapter, 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh. So the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Wow! Jesus also said that He's the only way to heaven in 1 John 5.20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. He is and eternal life. Romans 10, 12 to 13, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the same Lord, they speak of Jesus, whoever call upon the name of the Lord, God shall be saved. Jesus said, I am He. In John 8, 57 and 58, it says, Then the Jews said to Him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to Him, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. I am. <laughs> That's the name of God, if you remember, that He told Moses. John 8, 22 to 24. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself because he says, Where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, You are from the beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. It is very simple. John 13, 18 to 19. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. That's what he said, of course, about Judas in the Last Supper. Jesus is the first 
and the last. As Isaiah 44 verse 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. So look at the verse and look at the, at the language. First of all, there is no God. Yet I am the first, I am the last. I am the King of Israel and His Redeemer. Isn't that interesting? He's the Redeemer of Israel and He's the King of Israel. And this is exactly the things that were claimed by Jesus and were claimed by those who saw Him when He was here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, to whom are all things, and through whom we live. It's the same. One God, one Lord Jesus, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Amen. Look at us. Revelation 2, verse 8 says, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last. Same language of Isaiah. Who was dead and came to life. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. The Bible says that only God can be worshipped, ladies and gentlemen. And Jesus was indeed worshipped. In Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship Him. Only God can be worshipped, and they came to worship Him who was just born. Matthew 28, verses 8 to 9, So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring His disciples' word. And as they went to tell His disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held Him by the feet and worshipped Him. He was worshipped. Only God can be worshipped, and He is God. Only God not only can be worshipped, but also can be prayed to. Now, I have a lot of things to say about prayer, because Jesus taught us how to pray. But pay attention at what Acts chapter 7 suggests in verses 59 to 60. They stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow. Wow. Not only that he was worshipped, he was even prayed to by Stephen upon his stoning, upon his martyrdom. And what about the Trinity? Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples and of all nations, baptizing them in the name of what? Of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's Trinity. He's part of the Godhead. He is God. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. There's no doubt of His deity. What about John 20, verses 27 and 28? Then He said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at My hands, and reach your hand here and put it into My side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to Him, My Lord and My God. Wow! Thomas said, my Lord and my God, to whom? To Jesus. How can the Jehovah Witnesses say that He is not Lord? I don't understand. Bonus, I will give you one more. Acts 20, verse 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. 
the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The blood of God is the blood of Jesus. Jesus is indeed God. Romans 9, 28, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that myself, I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. And then he continues, Paul says, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. 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 So I want you to know that Jesus is, yes, He's the Messiah, yes, He's the Redeemer, yes, He's the one who shows you the way, but He's not a guru, He's not a, just a rabbi, He's not just a, a prophet, He's not just a good man, He's not just maybe, as some say, an angel, <laughs> and you know why I'm laughing, He is God, God in the flesh. And I want to tell you something. If you want to identify a cult, the first thing you need to ask is, what do they think about the deity of Christ? And I want to tell you, more and more and more people that I know today start departing from that truth that Jesus is God. It is so tempting. When, when you want to appease the Jews, you... you the only thing you need to do is deny the deity of God. When you want to appease the world, the only thing you need to do is deny the deity of God. When you, know, when you want to look cool, because it doesn't make sense that God came in the a, in a, in a form of a flesh over man, then you will deny the deity of God. If you want to be new agey, then you will say, yes, He's God, we are God, all of us are God. If you, if you want to look good in the eyes of all other religion, you will say that He was a good man. But the truth of the matter is that He is God. And unless you understand that, you will never be able to worship Him, and you will never be able to believe in Him, and you will never be able to accept Him, and you will never be able to have forgiveness of sins, because only God can forgive sins. And therefore, the teaching of the deity of Christ is under so much fire, is under so much attack and and I myself felt it recently how people even try to switch things and turn things around is as, as if I don't even believe in it this is probably the most important thing that I believe in when it comes to Jesus there is no doubt and I know it's hard for a Jew it's super hard for a Jew to believe that Jesus is God because the first thing and if you ever watch my testimony video it was hard for me. But what can I do? It is the truth. And if uh, either you believe in the truth or you deny it, but you cannot stay indifferent. Either you reject or embrace. But you cannot sit on the fence. And I, in, in 1990, in the month of June, in the movie theater in Jerusalem, when I watched the Jesus film of Campus Crusade, that night, I realized there is no doubt this is not only the King of Israel, not only <laughs> the Redeemer of Israel, He is God in the flesh. And now, because I believe in Him, I can get God the Holy Spirit in me. And He will never leave me nor forsake me. And I trust me, I go through so much, yet I know that He is with me. Emmanuel, God, is with us. Father, I thank you so much for your word. This message was pregnant with scriptures because it's really not all about what we think, it's about what you say. It's not about our opinion, it's about your word. And Father, we bless you for making it so clear throughout both Old and the New Testament that Jesus is Emmanuel, He is God 
who is with us. From the day of creation and from the moment he walked in the garden, from being the light of the world all the way to resurrect and never to die because it's the power of endless life. And Father, I thank you that although being equal to God, he stepped down and took upon himself the image of a servant, the person of a servant. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that He whoever believes in Him will never perish but have eternal life. The only thing that is left for us is to believe, because you did all the rest. And the only thing you want from us is faith. That's the only thing Jesus asked the disciples in the boat. Why is it that they don't have it? Where is your faith? Father, we ask that you will continue to strengthen our faith through Jesus, that you will continue to work in us, through us, and by us, and you will continue to use us to make fruits, and bring and make disciples. Father, I pray that we will not be busy with fighting with one another, but we will be busy doing our Father's business, making disciples, reaching the world, preaching the gospel, that Jesus is Lord, that He is God, and God came in the form of a man to save the world. We thank you for this amazing truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I love you. God bless you. And remember, He is Emmanuel. God bless you. I love you. Shalom from Eilat.